What a beautiful morning we're having so far. Thank you, Tiger, for doing the worship part, and for Ruth, and for Jan and Luis, and Larry, thank you for doing the Advent candle. You know, it is a special time of year. It is a time where we begin to prepare our hearts to celebrate once again the, the birth of Christ. And for us who have known that for many, many years, we can still celebrate and find great joy in it. And for those who may not know the Lord, my hope is that this year you begin to see just how amazing of a gift that truly was for this world. That Jesus Christ was willing to become like us so that he could die on a cross so that we could be reconciled with his Father. I was thinking about this section of scripture this week, Romans 8, 35 through 39, and it talks about God's everlasting love. And I'm going to try and hold it together, but there were times this week when I read this very section, and I would pause and wipe away the tears from my eyes because I realized just how amazing His love is. And how there are times even in my life where I struggle with the fiery darts that may come over the wall and I begin to believe the little words and the sayings that are taking place of, you're not good enough. Jesus doesn't love you. You're not worthy. You are a sinner. You have failed. God can't use you. And I think those are things that we all wrestle with. And I was reminded of Ignatius of Antioch. He's a bishop. And in 107 AD, he met his Lord, not by dying on a deathbed, but by being led into a slaughter. He was led into an amphitheater where they had wild beasts who were going to tear him apart. And what is so amazing about his story is that there were actually those who followed him and those who thought, maybe when we get to Rome, we can figure out a way to free him and to save him. And his response was, no, please don't save me. This is my plot, and I'm going to faithfully walk forward in it. And this is his famous quote. It says, allow me to become food for the wild beast, through whose means it will be granted me to reach God. I am the wheat of God, and I am ground by teeth of wild beast, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. And I think as we reflect on that, we as believers can be assured that Christ's love is sufficient to overcome the temporal and the spiritual realm in our lives. And the question is, would we be like Ignatius of Antioch? Would we be willing to tell people, don't rescue me? Because this is how I'm going to show just how much God loves me. Because nothing will separate me from his love. And I absolutely love this passage. So if you can open it to Romans 8, 35 through 39. I love how Paul works here. Paul is always asking questions to people. And he's always asking a way which is rhetorical. And in verse 35 he starts with. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or danger? Or sword? And I'll pause there. The sufficiency of Christ's love for believers is what we're going to see here. There is nothing that will separate us from his love. I will repeat this again. There is nothing that will separate us from his love. Because it's not us that love him. It's he who loved us. That's why we can love Jesus Christ. And if you look at these very words here that Paul writes, I want to say something. Because Paul did not write this as some armchair theologian or philosopher. He lived it. He has gone through all of this. He is in Rome and he has already gone through all of the different things that one person could go through. So for him to say, nothing is going to separate me from Christ's love. Then this is what I want to show you. And he begins this great passage. Think about it for a minute. Tribulation. How many of us have faced troubles? 
or struggles in our lives. There are times where we look at God and we say, I don't know what's going on in my life. I have no idea why I'm here, but nothing is going to separate you from God's love. Absolutely nothing. Or distress. Or persecution. Or famine. We here in America are not facing persecution. We face pressures. Yes, we have government officials and we have others that may be going against the very word of God and saying what you're saying is hate speech or they try and come at us. But no matter what they throw at us, it will never separate us from his love. No matter the persecution we may go through, it will not separate us from God's love. And the one thing that we can be assured of is that whatever we go through, Jesus has already gone through it. And he has already conquered it. So think about your daily life. And begin to ask, where are there times where I doubt God's love? Maybe it's as simple as getting a doctor's, something from the doctor, a test result that you didn't want to hear. You say, wow, God, do you really love me? Or maybe it's just something that goes on in your life. Maybe it's a loss of a job or loss of an income or loss of uh, of someone that was close to you. And in the back of your mind, you just think, well, maybe God doesn't love me enough. But none of it will separate us from his love. And I think what Paul is trying to say here is that Christ's love is more than sufficient for us. That no matter what we go through, his love is sufficient in all things. And what a great hope that is too. That while the rest of the world may look to other things and try and find ways to find love, maybe it's through trying to find a new relationship or trying to look to some sort of uh, addiction. And we say, well, this is where we can find love. But there's so much more to Christ's love. It is sufficient. We don't have to turn to anything else. It is why when two loved ones come together in marriage, and I've heard it said that they come together and they say, well, he doesn't love me enough or she doesn't love me enough because I wasn't loved as a child. And the counselor, the good ones say, but Christ loves you enough. Christ is the one who makes up for all of that love. So even as we go about our daily lives, there may be times where we just think to ourselves, I'm not loved, there's not enough, and Christ is going, but I am the one that fills that void. Famine or nakedness. Here's a tough one. If you were to lose everything today when you walk out of here, and all you have left is what you're wearing, is Christ's love still enough for you? Are you still going to look to him and say, wow, God, you still love me? Because here's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to continue to drive a wedge. He wants to do everything he can to start separating us from God. He wants to do everything possible to get us to go to this side and go, you know what? You're right. God's love isn't enough. And I can't be separated from it. Maybe there's a sense of moral failure or something that has gone on where you say there's no way I can be redeemed. But Christ's love is sufficient enough because he went to the cross and died on it for us. That's how much he loves us. Would we be willing to do that for our friends and our family members and our co-workers and our neighbors? If God just came to you and said, this is what you're going to do, would you be willing to say, I'm going to love them enough to go ahead and stand before the gunfire? Or would I sit behind the wall and hide? And I'll tell you, that's something that I wrestle with. Because there's days where I get the macho man like, yes, I would stand up there and I'd be ready to go. And then there's days where I'm like, no, I would be the one kind of hiding behind duck and going, please don't see me. But Christ's love is sufficient for all of us. And it is a love that redeems us. I want to continue in verse 36. It says, as it is written... For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be be slaughtered. 
You know, if you look at Psalm 44, 22, Paul is quoting that. And really what Paul is trying to say here is, look, we're all going to be persecuted. We are all going to go through times of suffering and great tribulation and hardships. There is no way that we are going to ever be left to not have a part of that. We are all going to face it at some point. There are things that we will face. And if you go even further, I just want us to be reminded of, if we look at, if you've got your Bibles, flip over to Matthew 5 for me. And I think Paul was also highlighting this just a little bit. If you look at verse 5, or chapter 5, sorry. Verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others rival you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We are going to face times of hardship. We are going to face struggles. And some of those struggles may be that we're just walking along and in our own spiritual journey, we're going, God, I don't hear you. I don't know where you are in my life right now. You're quiet. I'm coming to you before prayer. I'm on my knees crying out to you. Will you answer me? And I don't hear you. But I was reminded today as I was driving in this morning, sometimes we don't see how much God is at work. Because while we may see God not working in the three things that we're asking for, there are 10,000 other things that we don't see that God is doing in our lives. God is always at work. And I will say it again. You'll probably get sick of me saying this. But his love is sufficient. We need not to turn to anything else. We don't need to turn to all the other religions, all the other Little gods that they worship. We don't need to turn to all of the things that this world wants us to turn to. To find love. If we rest in his love. Then we will begin to see what God has in store for us. He is our true and wonderful savior. And he cares deeply about each of us. He loves us so much that I even believe that every Sunday when we're here, God has ordained that. Every moment that we wait, God has ordained that. That's how much he loves us. And we're going to see even further here, we'll see the sufficiency of Christ's love leads believers to being super conquerors. I love the Apostle Paul. He says no in verse 7 and verse 37. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, if you look at it in the Greek, it's hyper nikomen, which is kind of like this hyper conqueror. Let me tell you what that means. We are victorious in everything. We don't just barely squeak by the things that go on in our lives. When we overcome those things, we are victorious in those things. And why are we so victorious in those things? Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Do we live that way? Do we live in such a way where we realize that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we look at going this direction, and we go, oh, this is going to be rough and bumpy and hard. And yes, it will. But if we lived in a way that we lived victoriously and realized, no, no, Jesus has already got us through it. He's already overcome these things. And we are the overcomers as well because of his love. I honestly believe that if we truly live the way this section says we should live, we would fear absolutely nothing. All we would have is a healthy fear of what God can do. We would not fear man. We would not fear persecution. We wouldn't fear if we woke up in the morning and we saw a big fat zero in our bank account. Because he, oh my God, we're victorious. And what a great reward 
we have in heaven. Why not live that way? And yet I will tell you, there are times where I do. I struggle with it too. I think to myself, well, I'm not, this isn't victory here. I haven't succeeded here. Well, maybe I've got to do more. Maybe I've got to work a little bit harder. Maybe I've got to try a little bit more. And yet Jesus is just going, will you just come to me and realize how much I love you and that it's sufficient and realize that you have already had victory over this because I died on the cross. I think that's some of the things that we forget around Christmas. Yes, we celebrate and we enjoy the fact that there was a God who emptied himself and became like us. But he did it so that those who trust in him would be victorious and walk into heaven. What a great way to live. What a great way to look at things. If we looked at that in that light, I really think everything that comes our way, we would have a different understanding. It would be as there was a lady that I once knew that her daughter, when she was born, had all of these medical conditions. And you see her daily, and she's in a wheelchair, and she's got tubes down her nose and through her trachea, and all over the places. she's got to clean them out on a regular basis. There's alarms that go off and on all the time. And I remember there was one day I walked up to her, and I said, wow. I can't believe that you have to go through all this. And yet you have a husband who doesn't even know the Lord. And she looked at my wife and I and she said, but I'm already victorious. Because God has already given me the strength to see this through to heaven. And I know that my daughter who sits here in this wheelchair, even though she can't say much when I asked her one day, do you know who Jesus is? She blinked. And when I said, do you want to trust in him? She blinked again. She said, that's victory right there. And it's because she understood the sufficiency of Christ's love. Verse 38 through 39, we see the sufficiency of Christ's love is inseparable in the life of believers. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about that for a moment. Let's just take each one of them. For I am sure that neither death nor life. So if we truly believe in Jesus Christ, we need not to fear death. And that is a question that we all try and answer of what's going to happen when we die. Even unbelievers try and figure that out. It's the question we all wrestle with because we know that there's a day where, yes, we are going to finally close our eyes and we are not going to open them back up. And if we understand the sufficiency of Christ's love, then we won't ask those questions. We wouldn't say, well, what happens to me after I die? What happens if I open my eyes after I die and I realize I'm not with God? Maybe Jesus wasn't enough. I mean, if you think of the Apostle Paul saying this. I mean, he was left to die when he was stoned. I think he understands. He probably understands the struggle that we all go through as well. And then he says, look at life. Not even life can separate us from God. So he says... Not death, and not all the things that are going to come our way, not all the hardships, not all the pain, the suffering, the things that we're going to go through in this lifetime will separate us from God's love. If we are truly anchored in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then nothing will separate us from his love that we face. There is nothing in this life that will drive us from God. If we don't believe in Jesus, then yes, there will be that day when we close our eyes and we realize we're not with the Heavenly Father. There are times in our life where, yes, we will turn to other things if we don't trust in Him. But Jesus says, my life, my love is sufficient. And the Apostle Paul is driving this point home and he's making it clear. Nor angels, nor rulers... There's a real spiritual world out there. 
And some of us can see it. Some of us are in tune with it. Some of us have dreams. Some of us can pray about those things. Some of us encounter people that deal with it. Some of us just go about our regular day and go, I am so glad that I am not gifted in that light. My wife is one of those. And I tell her, I'm so glad I'm not gifted like you. Because the things that you share and the times that you have worked with other pastors and you have shared those things, I am so glad I'm not there. But not even those things can separate us from God's love. No matter what attack the devil may throw your way, it will not separate you from God's love. I once heard a counselor say there's times where we just have to rip out the tapes that are telling us these lies because all they are is nothing but lies from the pit of hell. That is not what Jesus says to us. Jesus is not saying you're not good enough. You can't do this. You have failed. You are gone. You are done. I'm kicking you out of heaven. That's not what he does. Jesus says come back to the cross. That's why I died on the cross for you. I want you to experience my love. Even when I discipline you. Even when there is remorse. Even when there is this time of, of repentance. You're going to experience my love. And if you want to see how much God loves people. All you have to do is read the Old Testament. Because I read it. And there are times where I'm like. Wow God you are a loving, loving father. Because there are times in those stories. Where I'd be like. I'm just kind of done. Let's just wash it. Start over. That didn't work. That's not what he does. He says, I have a great redemption plan. I have this great story of love. I have a savior, a son who is going to die on the cross for you. So nothing can separate us. Not even anything, whether good or bad angels. There's nothing that's going to separate us. They can't lob anything our direction. That will ever separate us from his love. Nor things present, nor things to come. I don't know where you are today. Maybe there's things that you are struggling with. Maybe there's things that we have doubts with. Maybe there's, there's a sense of, I don't know where to turn. Or maybe you're in that moment where you're like, God, I, I just, I don't hear you. I don't see what's going on right now. I have all this hardship. There's things that are going on in my life that I I didn't know that I'd have to go through. Maybe you're right now just going, you know what, life, God, right now where I'm at is it just stinks. This is not fun. But even the things in the future that may come our way will not separate us from His love. There is nothing that can drive a wedge between the love that He extends us when we call Him. Our Lord and Savior. As I said before, we have to rip out the taste. We have to rip out the lies. And look at it. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth. There is no height or depth that will ever separate us from God's love. If we are truly followers of Jesus Christ, if we have given our lives to him, No matter how far we go down, Jesus still loves us. Jesus still cares about us. Jesus still wants to bring us back to repentance. He still wants to bring us back to the cross and say, this is why I died on the cross. This is how much I love you. I am going to go there and I'm going to continue to chase after you no matter how far down you go or no matter how high you go. There is no way you're getting away from my love. You can't get away from it. I don't know about you, but there are times where in my own Christian life where I have just been walking and I just feel the weight of Jesus and his love. I had a friend who once shared a story with me that he was in Chicago. And there was a gentleman that was helping him uh, clean his shoes because he had asked for food and he had given it to him. And the man was six foot four, gigantic. Dark alley, not in a place where you really want to be. And the guy looks at him and goes, why is there not fear in your eyes? He says, because no matter what you do or whatever happens here, I'm not going to be separated from his love. 
God has ordained this moment. And at that moment, he gave him his food, and he said, thank you, and he walked off, and my friend said he looked around for him and couldn't find him. But he could feel just how much God loved him there. And I think if we pause and we allow ourselves to rest in Jesus, we would see just how much he loves us. Yet we pack our, our lives with technology, with all the books, with all the knowledge, and everything that we try to do. We try and look at it as, well, if I read enough books, I'll understand God's love. Or if I read this, I'll find the answer. And all Jesus wants to do is just to rest in his love. I say, you know what? You are sufficient. And to make sure that Paul did not forget anything, he says, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means nothing. I will tell you the Greek word there for all is all. It is one of the greatest words you can use because Paul really says there is nothing. There is absolutely nothing in creation that's going to separate you. I don't care what list you want to try and give me. I don't care what you say. Well, you didn't say this, Paul, or maybe you didn't put this in here. No, that doesn't matter. Nothing in creation is going to separate us from the love of Christ. And I'll say it again. It's not because we loved him. It's because he loved us. That's how deep his love is. That before any of us were even a thought, before any of us were even born, Jesus said, I'm going to love them. And I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to show them just how much I love them. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to open my arms and allow them to drive the spikes through my wrist and through my feet. I'm going to allow myself to be beaten and torn. Because God, I love these people. And I want them to experience the love that you have. There is nothing in creation that will separate us. And yet I think at times we just look to everything else and we begin to allow it to chip away. And we start to believe the lies. And my hope is that today as we begin Advent and we think about Christmas. If you are in that spot where you're like, you know what, I I don't know if God loves me. And I ask you just to fall on your knees. And say, God, will you show me just how much you love me? And pause. It's not going to be a gigantic lightning bolt. It may but he may start to point out the little things that he's doing in your life. The friends that he surrounded you by. The church body that he has put you around. Your neighbors, your co-workers that are believers. Maybe it's just as simple as waking up in the morning and having that one verse that comes across the radio station that you just know by heart. And that brings joy. So what do we do with this? We must recognize that Christ's love is powerful enough to overcome any spiritual force. I will say this. We need to stop giving Satan a lot of credit. We need to stop saying, oh, you've got this. Look at the power and the authority and what you can do. We need to stop. And we need to realize that God's love has overcome all of that. And that nothing that he, everything that Satan does is not because he gets to do it on his own. It's because it's given authority by God. It is shifted through his hands. If we look at Job, we see how much God loved him. We need to realize that. The other part is this. Live life victoriously. Live life as a super conqueror, this hyper conqueror. Live in such a way that you realize that there is nothing that's going to separate you from God's love. And I think it's one of the hardest things even for our youth to understand because they get inundated by everything today. And yet God says, no, 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 I still love you. I don't care how far you go this way, I'm going to chase after you. So I want to bring you back to the cross. 
My love reaches all the way to where you're going to go. And by the way, when you think you're already there, you go, I've gone far enough where Jesus doesn't love me. Well, I'm already there standing there waiting for you. He's already there. Every moment we wake, every, mon- every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday, every minute, every second that we are breathing, God is there and he loves us. And we will not be separated from that love. We need to live victoriously. And my hope as we close this service and we focus on communion, we realize just how much God loved us. Think about what we are going to do. We are going to take part in remembering what Jesus did on the cross. This is the ultimate sign of love. He laid his life down for us. And it's not because of what we did. It's not because we sing hallelujah before that or we did some great thing. It's because he just deeply loves us. And he wants us to experience that love. So as we go to a time of prayer, I'm going to pause for a few moments. And I want you just to reflect on what God's doing in your life. And before we take communion, if there is a moment where you are going, you know, God, I just, I don't know. Give it to him. Let him redeem that part. Ask him. You know, God, let me just understand how great your love is. Let me understand how sufficient it is for me. Let us rest in that. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, And as we prepare our hearts for communion, we pause for a moment, asking you to come into our lives. And if there are areas, Father God, where we don't believe that you love us enough, I pray that we would give that to you. And as we pause for a moment, Lord, I pray that we would cry out to you. It is a love that is unbreakable. It is a love that will chase after us. It is a love that will reconcile us. It is a love that will point out the things that we need to give to you. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much that you were willing to share your love with us. And I do pray, Father, that as we come before communion, if there is anyone who is not right with you, or anyone who has not come before you or called upon your name and called upon Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would do that. And that during the season, they would see just how much you love them. We thank you, Jesus.